Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Networks for Nature 2020, hosted by UEA, and uh, to our online headline literary event. Um, we're sorry we're a few minutes late joining. We're aware of that. We've had the dreaded technical difficulties. Um, one of our speakers and conference organizers, John Fanshaw, will probably hopefully come back with us shortly, but we've lost him briefly. So um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for sticking with us. It's been a long process. Um, maybe I'll ask my colleague, Joss Smith, who's one of the organizers together, John, Joss, and I have um, organized and reorganized this conference a number of times uh, to, to, to say something about our, our process. Joss. Hi, oh, yeah. So um, uh, we hope to be having this in the in the summertime um, and then we deferred it to the autumn, um, but it was still going to be in person and now it's online. Um, we were just discussing in our sort of green room of this. Um, this is an extraordinarily big panel. It, it, it goes from Fife down to South Africa and out west to Cornwall. Um, it lands in Norwich and London, um, all on one panel. Um, so uh, Whoever thought we'd be doing this in, in, in quite the way we are. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we are just really pleased to, um, to be doing something and offering something. Um, and, uh, and we're really grateful to Tim and Kathleen for being here. Yes, thanks, Joss. Um, so John, John has popped up again. John, would you like to introduce yourself and say hello to our audience? Absolutely. Welcome, everybody. And um, my apologies for disappearing into the Cornish gloom. I'm back. Um, yeah, no, I'd just like to welcome Tim, Kathleen, and, and perhaps offer a very warm vote of thanks to them and to, to my co-organizers, um, Joss and, and Jean, for the extraordinary work that they put in um, from UEA to, to make this work, which has been a um, quite an adventurous year one way or another, and it's, it's really fantastic to, to be able to do this. So thank you, everybody, and I'll, I'll hand back to, to Jean for the main event. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, John. Um, and yeah, our great thanks, of course, go to Kathleen and Tim, who've also stuck with us. We'd hope to be doing this on stage in Norwich with all of you in the audience, and we're going to try our best to recreate that sense of ease and freewheeling discussion and collegiality here, despite being squares on a, on a screen. So um, I think we'll do it. How this is going to run, uh, Tim and Kathleen and I, mostly them, you'll be happy to hear, are going to have a discussion for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll take some questions from the audience. I'll do that. I'll look at your questions. They need to be typed in in the chat to the YouTube um, function. You might need to quickly set up an account to do that. I'm sorry, but that's the way it works. Um, so we, we, we're very much looking forward to getting your questions and responses, <clears throat> and we'll do that at the very end. So um, first of all, I would like to say that by way of introduction, uh, we'll be talking about Tim and Kathleen's latest books, in the case of Tim Greenery, which I haven't got to brandish because it's in my office in uh, UEA, which is 200 kilometers away, and Kathleen's Surfacing. But we're going to be, I think, moving um, around a lot in there. Oh, thank you. John's done the <laughs> job for me. Thank you. Um, but what I, uh, you know, really enjoyed, I think I, I would say about these both, both of these books, um, and to try to draw some communality between them. They're very, very different. You're very different writers, you've got very distinct approaches, very distinct languages. Um, is, is there a range and their awareness on all levels? And I think we'll be talking about that. Their learnedness, learnedness but how they wear their knowledge lightly, um, which I think is incredibly hard to do as a writer. You give your knowledge to us as, as a gift, but also they're both migratory books they shuttle back and forth across time, across place. Um, they encompass decades of your lives, both of them. And they take us to physical places, which we may well never experience ourselves, but with an extraordinary amount of intimacy um, and observational acuity. And of course, um, your language, which we're, you know, we're all writers who are interested in writing, and, and I hope to discuss that. Um, because you both have, an, ex, uh, in my view, an extraordinary ability, a really rich interpretive uh, lexicon. So we wanted to start talking about place. As we've acknowledged, Tim's in Cape Town, or just outside Cape Town, Kathleen's in Fife. Um, and uh, one of my favorite phrases of Kathleen's is, by the way, that you're Scottish by latitude, which 
is a line from surfacing which i absolutely love to actually have allegiance to latitude rather than nation state and um but but tim you've written that people are made up by places uh, uh in greenery and it's an interesting utterance it's rather than rather than people are made up of places or people are made of places um by places and you've also said that you both work together you and kathleen all differently, although differently, against um, specialness. And that you start with the familiar in the unfamiliar, um, and perhaps the unfamiliar in the familiar, in your home ground. And I wondered if you could say something, both of you, about your, your current home ground and your relationship with it. Um, perhaps, Tim, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean. Um, yeah, well, I, well I, I think a lot of my writing is about trying to find ways to be at home in the world. Um, and I've chiefly done that by knowing the, the birds that are around me. That seems to be the weird way I found best. Uh, I just found today my first um, uh, white neck raven feather uh, walking along by the ocean side here in, in, uh, outside of Cape Town. We live in a village called Scarborough. Um, so home, making home, finding home by knowing the birds that are making homes around you has been my thing for a long time. And I think most of my writing has has commuted backwards and forwards with that idea. I mean, this last book is the greenery book. is is a, It was also about birds that carry take their home with them that, that that don't need any one place but need multiple places to live or can be at home wherever they are. I always say that um, one of the reasons I love birds more than anything is that they don't carry bags that you know they don't need passports um so the place for them is 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 a uh, it exists in time uh, rather than in, uh, and, and, and through the air often is achieved through the air uh, migratory birds above all um do that but um so i i love the the foot looseness of birds when it comes to place making and, and home making uh, and of course, I, we we can't do that ourselves. We are we are destined to forever carry those awful, uh, short, small wheeled um, uh, suitcases around. Our, you know, airport halls. If we ever get back to airports. Um, so, yeah, I I ended up I, I've ended up living now in in South Africa for much more lo longer than I expected. I came here and was was uh, was made a prisoner here. I came here for good reasons. Uh, in order to to be with my wife when she had a, uh, our first baby, our only baby to date, uh, probably our only baby forever, I hope, um, not for any bad reason. But um, so anyway, I, I I came in the expectation of, of 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 a bit of homemaking, but not not to be here as long as I have ended up being here, which I I haven't been able to take my baby, our baby back to see his half brothers and his grandmother and so on in, in Britain. In the meantime, my father's died in Britain. Uh, so I feel slightly, interestingly now, problematically in 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 a, in a, in a new place where I'm trying to make a new a new home, um, with all sorts of questions about how how to do that. Again, going to the birds and, and, and always that you know learning the birds being the place that I start, you know, to to make things familiar, to make the to make the to make the commonplace understandable and to make myself able to join a community of the commonplace in some ways um, by by knowing the birds and, and, and understanding that they are they are at home here and they are the regulars and the, and the residents I'm not very interested although I spent a lot of my early years as a bird watcher chasing after rare birds and errant vagrants uh, I've increasingly got interested in not those species although I did go on a twitch just the other day to see an American golden plover two miles away down south from, from where I'm talking to you which is blown across the Atlantic in the aftermath of the American election um but I'm really not interested in or not interested in in accidentals in in vagrants I, I'm much more interested in the the, the ordinary and the familiar uh, because they they seem to tell me how to be at home in a place uh, and, and that's that sending up now what I'm writing about, in fact, is, is by new, some of my new writing, it will be about very much overlooked and underloved birds, but which are, are very familiar birds, new birds to me, but very familiar birds to the, to my neighbors here in, in, in the suburbs of Cape Town. Thank you, Tim. Kathleen. Well, I'm 
speaking to you from the, the home I've lived in for the last 25 years, which is in, in North Fife. And um, oh, of late, we've been here, of course, for, for hmm. I'm beginning to weary of Fife. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm beginning to weary of not being able to go places. Um, so uh, making a virtue of a necessity, really, I've been, been writing writing locally. But I, I realised only this morning that I write, perhaps, as you know, across uh, non-fiction and poetry. And I realise I cannot write poetry from the exotic and I cannot write the long non-fiction pieces locally. For the, for the non-fiction pieces, I need the stimulus of other places and other people to speak to. But as I say, the poems are all almost all grounded in something nearby, something I know well. Why that should be, I, I can't answer. They're, they're obviously coming from a different part of my mind. But I'm, I'm stuck to, to, as I have been all my writing life, I'm, I'm stuck to say, I can't tell you what it's for, what the writing's for. Um, it grew when I was a teenager out of self-rescue. You know, I think many writers start out of self-rescue. Um, not from any great trauma, just from a, a life that seemed and needlessly limited, you know, the, the options that were being held out to me as, as a teenage girl in those days were ridiculously limited. And I thought there must be another way, there must be another route to, to a wider, richer, better life, the, the life I can see out the window. And that's what my writing has been for. Um, I didn't come to so-called nature writing until well on in my, my career, until I was about 40. Yes, 40. My 40th birthday present to myself was a, a bird identification course. And that's when I thought, that's what this is lying. This whole natural world thing is lying there under, under spoken about in those days. And and why is that? And why are we not writing about it? And, and so for the last twenty years, I've been concentrating on. I wouldn't say the local, but certainly the natural and our relationship to it, and how we can work with language to. To do whatever it is we're doing, witnessing, advocacy. I'm not sure. But mm. That's what I've been at. No, great. Well, thank you. I mean, yes, we were talking about that earlier in the nature writing panel. Um, you know, what are we doing this for? But um, we're going to get to that. But I wondered if for the moment, given that we can't travel, yeah, you can't travel physically, your work takes us uh, again to so many places between the two of you from Western Alaska to Tibet, to Orkney, to Hungary, the Sahel, um, I mean, two places that we both, uh, we've all sort of agreed on. Um, Kathleen, your rendition of, of the village that you spent time in in Western uh, Alaska, mm -hmm. and I'm probably not going to say this right, but I think it's Kinagak, is that right? Quinahawk. Quinahawk. <laughs> okay, close but no cigar. Quinahawk. I mean, it is the most extraordinary, um, it's like a kind of pellucid dream, your rendition of it. And, and Tim, I'm going to laterally ask us to go to the back to the Sahara by, by you. And I suppose there isn't, I've, I've not got any great kind of world shattering question about this, but Kathleen, the dream vision of the tundra, the way that you describe it is, um, is kind of hyper real, really. Um, and, I, you know, I could quote some, some uh, passages here, but uh, one thing that I did notice was you wrote the vision of the land stayed with me and I have to say it stayed with me too. Um, is it fair to say that you had a kind of unexpected affinity with that place? It's so rare in my life to be able to sit still and just look. You know, there's always something needing doing and that's that's a fault in myself. I think I, I don't allow myself to do it. Perhaps that's one of the reasons I need to go away from, from my home domain in order to write and think and look properly. You know, but they are being there in this vast reach of landscape, the biggest landscape I've ever seen. And even for half an hour, just to sit and look at it is a, is a rarity. And I could read you a short section about exactly that, about how the more you look, the more you see. Would that be? Yeah, yeah I think that would be perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'm going out with a, a friend with her telescope and she's, she's a bird watcher and she wants to sit and just look. On a long tussock, we set up the telescope. Here, we were visible, giving our presence to bears. On the tussock grew dwarf birch, a few salmon berries with leaves turning red, and Labrador tea. The difference in altitude of only a few inches supported a different fauna to the lower land around. 
Between us and the mountains grew miles of shifting, breathing greens, damp loving grasses that fringed invisible ponds and waterways. We chose to sit quietly and in a short space of time, maybe 20 minutes of looking out over the landscape, I realised my eyes were adjusting, my vision sharpening. There was the close at hand, flowers and bright berries where we sat, then the middle distance which resolved itself into bands of grasses, each swaying in the breeze in its own way. In the far distance, a heat haze shimmered from the land. Black wavering shapes were ravens rising and falling through the air. After 30 minutes or so, I could see colours better until the haze distorted them. Details emerged. How would I feel to notice the three grass stems next to my right knee, bound together by a ball of spiderweb? When a pale bee entered a fireweed flower, it was an event. A quiet meditation. Malaya sat some yards away, half turned to look southward, occasionally lifting her binoculars, naming a bird she saw. My hearing sharpened too. After 45 minutes, I could distinguish the different sounds the breeze made in the various grasses. A little bird nearby was making a buzzing noise, like a small electrical fault. Uh, the ripple of pondside reeds, the light on distant mountains. Then an owl appeared, labouring towards us with a fat lemming dripping from its claws. We watched the tundra. But the tundra, they say around to you, is watchful too. The people say, it's like something's looking at you. There are stories of disappearance and reappearance out on the tundra. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. The, the sense that there's so much um, kind of spectral, ghostly um, lore and things that actually happen and visions and half visions. And it, it seems that it has a kind of magnetic presence. It's quite mystical that place and I mean similarly yes sorry uh, my thinking was if I felt like that after 45 minutes those people have lived there for 10,000 years just how acute you know and how knowledgeable are they going to be you know yeah yeah and you and you chart that um, process of course of being able of it being a blur at the beginning and then and then gradually like a like you learn a language being able to pick out its its sure. details and, and read that landscape and, and Tim, I mean, in greenery, you take us to so many um, different places. You're, you're very well traveled. But again, something that really stuck with me was your portrait of, um, of Chad when you go on a bird watching expedition to Chad. And you, you're very careful as a writer not to reduce things, not to lean on stereotype. Um, but yet, you, you know, it, what, what happens in that place is that it's, it's, it's quite a hostile, um, intimidating landscape but you both acknowledge that and also let us into its its drama yeah i hope so um i mean I, it was my first time attempting to cross the sahara or to, to go into the sahara uh, and i principally wanted to do it but in order to to spend some time with birds that i knew know from britain british spring migrants uh who, who winter south of the sahara in the sahel uh, and see some of them and keep time with them and keep time with their passage north into this extraordinary landscape that is is immensely hostile to them. Uh, the, although amazingly, the tiniest of birds do that journey. Every bird that, every swallow that's come back to Britain and to nest in, 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 our, in our nearby um, buildings has, has already flown twice across the Sahara. And smaller birds, smaller, less able to fly birds, willow warblers, extraordinary. Yeah, and trying to therefore think of of the of the the weight and the energy of, of a single willow warbler, which weighs a gram or something like that, a little more than a gram, against the grains of the desert and its extraordinary um, uh, hostile uh, uh, surface temperatures, um, lack of shelter, lack of shade, lack of water. Uh, it makes it very hard thing to write. I mean, of course, you you reach for you reach for. Um, uh, sublimities and and and, uh, and and grandeur and 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 big noise because it's a big a big thing. But as Kathleen's just described as well, it's often it, what what really comes home when you're down on your knees in that sort of place looking for dead birds, as I was, is is the is the absolute granular granularity of it. I mean, it is exactly the the, the three stems of grass uh, tied together by a spider's web, as Kathleen describes in the tundra. I notice she doesn't talk about. The, you know the, the the width of view, the scale, the, you know the, the the vastness. I mean, I I I grappled with the vastness of the Sahara, 
and, and, and sort of put it to one side. I describe it by describing how hard it was to describe, but that's, that was my, my strategy for that. And then I go into the intimate individual lives of the birds we saw eking out their tiny survivalist um, uh, lives uh, in, in, in the thorn trees and then in, in the shade of, of rocks as we got further north into the desert proper. Um, maybe I could read, actually not now, if that's appropriate, Jean, um, not from uh, not from the desert, but from a bird which crosses the desert a, a little bit, right from the very end of the book about um, spotted flycatcher, which is a tiny, small bird that's familiar to people in Britain, but a rather quiet and modest bird. Um, and in some ways that that's a, a, a totemic bird for me because it, it it is so quiet and so slight and yet it makes these extraordinary journeys and and it's and it's intrinsic to my making of a spring in Britain to see that could, could I read that and and, that, and it, it, in some yeah. ways it gives it gives you the the Sahara the, the not writing about the Sahara <laughs> but writing about something else if you see yes, but the, the, anti, right, the anti-Sahara yes absolutely yeah. It would be lovely. Uh, it's right at the end, so it, it occurs right at the very end. It's, in fact, it's the last section just before we pack up and go home. And everything I write is about how it's about getting ready to die, really. And, and being in the desert made me acutely aware of, of how you need to prepare yourselves to die because that's what a lot of dying goes on there. Uh, and I think a lot of my bird watching is about uh, trying to take myself to a place where I don't. Uh, I won't any longer be looking at the birds that I'm looking at at the moment that I'm looking at them. Uh, and that's why the spotted flycatcher comes in. Uh, this is actually a, a, a bird describing uh, right at the northern range, at limit of its range in, in northern Norway, north of 60, in, in the Hardanger field. Uh, a spotted flycatcher woke me with the snap of its beak as it took a fly just a meter from my chair. I've heard their beaks more often in my life than their song which is thin and slight and often lost in the leaf shuffle and green linked us of late spring trees. They're dusty gray and mousy birds. In the summers of my teenage years, when summer still existed for me, a pair nested in the broken wall of the back garden of my home in Bristol, and I lay in bed late into the day. Sorry, as I lay in bed late into the day, I used to hear them through my open window, snapping when all else was quiet. In May, I'd heard one sing at Horner Woods on Exmoor, or rather, I saw its beak move and convinced myself that some slight song was added to the sound stream of the wood in full utterance. Otherwise, it was only snaps, the Hardanger bird in Norway, and one in the churchyard opposite my house in the Fens in June, and the same sound from a wintering migrant the previous December in the bone-dry Cedarberg in South Africa, as it made fly-catching sallies from some burnt trees along a river edge. The species returns to breed where it was bred, and it shows fidelity also to its wintering places, rhyming the swing swoops of its flight in Africa with the same in England or Norway, one perch on one continent, conjuring a second on another. That tiny snap at the quiet limits of my hearing, at the quiet limits of the world's ear, had also moved from Southern Africa to Scandinavia. Its curtailed and midget percussion, like one soft click of the fingers, made the planet beyond it feel, sound and seem vast to me and the bird's journey from one snap to another, equally bewildering, vast and bewildering, yes, but also minutely real as well, local, actual, and total. Somewhere between the top of Europe and the bottom of Africa, a spotted flycatcher snaps after a fly every daytime minute. Think of those snaps as heat. As any sound wave ages and moves away from its source, it becomes heat. Think of those snaps warming the world between the bird's summer and its winter homes, its spring and its autumn flies. Think of its catch, a snap as I have written the word, a take, and another now. Thank you, Tim. That's lovely. Um, I wanted to ask you both about uh, uh, the a subject of, um, well, transcendence. That's where I'm going anyway. But Kathleen, <laughs> just so that you know. <laughs> <laughs> a light-hearted topic coming up but but Kathleen you write in surfacing I think actually twice I I, I, I um, read this uh, proposition of the writer as inhabiting two worlds um, now of course we can imagine that there is the actual world and there's the imaginative world there's the world that you are you as writers are engaged in resurrecting um, and we have a very powerful 
metaphor in, in both books, in, in Tim's it's spring and renewal and in yours it's surfacing, that's not the only metaphor on the table, but, but yet I notice that, that surfacing and this notion of being in two worlds does apply to both books. Um, for example, memory and geology, I think for both of you, share the fact that they both have strata and you write and talk about things emerging, memories coming back to you, sparking other memories. Um, awarenesses, situational awarenesses, places that you are in place, sparking memories of, of, of times, other times in your lives. The two that really stood out for me, and there's there's quite a few options really, but um, Kathleen, your trip, uh, ultimately unsuccessful to Tibet itself, um, uh, as China closed it in 1989. And Tim, your stay, which sounded really pretty miserable, actually, if you don't mind me saying so, in Budapest in 1986-87, when you went there for a year to study Hungarian poetry. And we've talked in our correspondence about these, these episodes emerging out of the glacial archaeology of, of your lives. So I wondered if, if it was there an element of surprise for both of you, were you planning to write in this way of, 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 of your, your pasts? Um, and, and how much of how much of the personal story do you feel should or does uh, appear in nature writing? How much of, of nature write of what you're doing in your books is the power of, of the personal? But I'm thinking specifically of those two episodes because they're so vivid and yet they're not quite the, the focus of both of your books. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah, sorry. Like I say, ultimately I'm thinking about transcendence, but um, but those 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 times they they are your your um, accounts of them they are transcendent or I found them so. What do you mean by transcendent? I think they communicated to me the ultimate project and mysticism of living the project of 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 of, of being in the world. I suppose they weren't just they weren't just portraits of a time and they went beyond that. Well, that's 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 good. I'm glad if they deepen out. But, um, I'm not I'm not. I'm not sure about them being transcendent. I think um, it may, I, I don't know quite how to approach that uh, question, but it might help to say that I have no idea, no idea what I'm writing before I write it, which makes, um, it makes me, it's a nuisance. I'd love to be able to set myself a theme and then scurry around, quote, researching that theme and then type it all up. That would make my life so much easier. But it doesn't work like that for me. I have to write the damn book and then afterwards, afterwards go, jeez, it was about my mother or whatever, you know. So only after this book was finished did I and my editor say to each other, what, what is this? And understand that, that, that a recurrent theme, not a metaphor, but a recurrent theme was surfacing which could become a metaphor, literal surfacing out of the earth and archaeological digs, surfacing out of memory, you know, so it all, it could cohere around that idea, but no way did I start out with that intention, you know, which is just always the case. You've got to find where you're going by going there. Yeah, so, absolutely. Tim, does that help? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. I, I, um, I think I was telling myself stories about my experience in, in Hungary uh, long before I started writing about it. In fact, I went back to my, I used to keep a diary when I was there, an incredibly boring diary, self-pitying, miserable, as you were suggested my whole year was, um, recording my miserable phone calls to my failed relationships and so forth. Um, and that was no good to me when I came to writing about it, because actually in the meantime, I told myself a different story about where 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 my body had moved through the, the glacier at that time uh, to, uh, as you say um i i think the only thing to add to that in, in for me is that it's it's always been incredibly important to me and i'm struggling with this now um to have been in a place uh without seeking at that time to write about it uh, when i come to write about it again uh, so ideally, I go to a place twice. I've been back many times to Hungary since I was there, uh, and that's helped me feel okay about writing about it that first time. Um, I think to go out, as Kathleen said, in some ways, in search of a story, in search of writing it from a place, 
uh, or from your life at a certain time. You know, to go for a walk and attempt to write about going for the walk is, uh, well, you can do it. People do it. And, 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 and a lot of nature writing today perhaps um, requires that to be the case. Uh, uh, but I, for me, it's the, the best writing will always come from a return or, 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 a, or, a, or a reprocessing of an experience, um, at least. I mean, and that's why my notebooks are so important, um, you know, because there's, 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 there's a version of something that goes down into them. But the, the notebook is not, is not in my intention at the, at the point of writing the notebook to turn what is written in the notebook into, into publishable prose. Uh, it's a list of birds, basically, for me. Um, and so, I, again, going out in search of writing is, is, is much, harder for me and not and not to be encouraged really cannot be done uh, I have to I have to get, come back to a place really and, and then find the writing uh, in, on a second or third or fourth visit in some ways of course I haven't been to this I've only been to the to Chad and the Sahara what we were talking about earlier once so that was that was part of my problem in, in, in writing about that was the feeling that I was a tourist effectively and picking up some of the themes you were discussing in some of your earlier panels about the, the difference between uh, travel writing, if you like, and, 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 and memoir and, and, and nature writing or whatever it is that, that, that I'm writing or Kathleen is writing. Um, I don't like the idea of going out on a trip and, and turning it in, into words in that way. It, it needs to come, it, it can turn into kind of private words for me in the notebook, which but that mostly is, as I said, a list of birds. Uh, but somehow the list of birds doesn't kill the place. The list of birds is a, is a way to re, reinflate the place 20 years down the line. You know, I, I, I started writing that, that, that chapter about Hungary with a list of birds that I, I wanted to mention that I'd seen, that I knew that I'd seen in that, through that winter in Hungary and as I became more and more miserable about my failed girlfriend and, or rather my failure to have a girlfriend. And, um, and then found the spring to be so much a wonderful uh, balm, and uh, you know, a, a moment of transcendence, of, of lift off, literally. Uh, so that made me feel I actually had a, had had a good time there. Mm -hmm. And again, actually, when I looked at my diaries, they it didn't quite work like that. But uh, I knew that the the real effect of that was was as I wrote it now. I think rather than as I wrote it then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I very much, um, uh, it resonates with me, certainly, that you don't know what you're looking for. It's the it's the looking that, as a writer, it's the writing that takes you to it, and it emerges afterwards. There's an afterwardsness to to writing. And and Tim, yes, at times, I mean, I think your, your, the personal aspects of your writing, anything to do with people or you or anybody you meet or characters, they're so vivid, but in some ways it's it's the birds that 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 tie it together. They, they create the mesh for 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 greenery. Um, I wanted to ask you both. It's a, it's a writerly question, and I hope everybody's interested in this. But it's about language. Um, Tim, you quote Rilke in uh, in greenery in Letters to Young Poet, saying most happenings are beyond expression. And Kathleen, you also you quote a poet. Ian Crichton Smith, he who loses his language loses his world. And then you invert it. You wonder if you lose your world, um, do you lose your, your language? So, I mean, language is what stands between us and the more than human world in a sense. We have language. Uh, we're not sure if mountains and, and rivers and animals have language. We don't really ultimately know, but 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 this is this is what uh, allows us to bridge that gap, but it's also what um, restricts us. How do you both go about, have you ever come up against the ramparts of language? I suppose that's my question, you know, in, is, is there anything that's unexpressible? How do you get into um, the difficult terrain between ourselves and the more than, than human world? <sighs> I let the professor answer that one first. <laughs> oh dear, professorial question. Oh no. <laughs> uh, really, professors? I'm not one any longer. So um, I used to believe that language was the fall, that we fell into language and that was our undoing. I used to go dead early in the morning and try to keep my mind in a pre-language state and then rush outdoors and try and meet the world without, without language you know, getting in the way. I then realized this is nonsense and language is our way of being in the world and we might as well embrace it. Language is what we do as human beings and as writers, as poets, it's 
a heightened way of being in the world. You know, we, we of all people, have got to be out there making the language work, refining its textures, pushing it around, you know. So that's what I've been striving to do. And sometimes, sometimes it's not easy, you know. And that's the point I find it really fascinating, you know, to be holding the language up like a, a newspaper against the fire, just to the point where it starts to scorch, you know. If you get that, then it's great. Of late, I've been thinking a lot about lyric and lyricism. As a lyric poet, you know, it's obviously close to my heart. But um, if how can we do lyric in a, a, a dismantling world? Is it aestheticizing the problem, you know? Thomas Berry, ecotheologian, said, the world is leaving its lyric phase. If the world is indeed leaving its lyric phase, can we meet that crisis with lyric? These are, these are my writerly questions, you know? That, I, I don't solve them, but I do push them around the page, so. But I think writing, uh, language is what we do. Yeah, I, should I say a little tiny thing? I mean, I, yeah, I, one, one of the things I try to ensure or insist upon to, to myself is that I, however far-fetched the, the, the linguistic or journey I, I, I go on in terms of describing birds, say, uh, whatever metaphors I apply to them or similes or whatever, however, I, I'm pushing them towards fantastical st statuses, um, you know, which they, they obviously don't have. I mean, the, 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 you know, bird song is not to be really viably compared to a blues singer singing, I'm so glad when he isn't glad. But I, I, want, to, I want to say a certain bird makes me think of that song. Um, but I always go back having found those formulations, having found those, that metaphorical leap uh, or, or drive into, into, into a kind of um, heightened language, if you like, whether it's lyric or not, I'm not sure. So it's certainly heightened. Uh, um, I try to test then, take that, take that heightenedness back and, and reapply it to the, to the bird song that I've, I've, I've stolen it from, in effect, and, and, and make sure it, it still, works and make sure the bird isn't crushed by what I've said about it. Um, I mean, that's a, again, that's a ludicrous thing to think about in terms of what your, your earlier panelists were discussing and talking about, but it's the way it makes it work for me. I mean, no, no ideas, but in things, I mean, I'm a materialist, uh, William Carlos Williams, um, I, I, and I believe in the, the thingness of, 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 the, of, of, of other species. Uh, and that's incredibly important to me. But I also know that language is 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 what we clothe those things in, um, and it and, uh, and language is what, as Kathleen said, is what we what we've got. It is it is what makes us who we are. Uh, and so, it's a. I hope I'm not being too exploitative. I hope I'm not wrenching those creatures into a into a an owned or or or. or, or Forcing them into costumes they don't, they, they never could conceivably put on themselves. Um, you know, I, the world is too much with us. You know, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Said Wordsworth. I, I, I'm always, I'm acutely aware that we mustn't appropriate, and yet that's that is what language does effectively. Language, language, the nature writer's language is is an act of, is a, inevitably an act of appropriation. It's interesting to think about. Uh, I mean, in nature, is nature writing the place we've gone gone to? Because it, nature doesn't talk back to us and say, actually, that's not, you, you know, you can't talk about my sombrero because it's my sombrero, not, um, not yours. Uh, I mean, the, the nightingale doesn't, hasn't yet said to us, uh, that's all wrong. I mean, lots of writers have said what we've said about the nightingale is wrong, but the nightingale hasn't said what you've said about me is wrong. Uh, so, but, but, but to play that game ourselves as writers, I think is quite an important one. It makes the writing better if you can attempt to test your own formulations back against the scene, the place, the, the, the bird, whatever it is that you're, 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 you're loading that language onto. This, this fascinates me. I'm, I'm fascinated by apostrophe when we speak to another creature and when we speak as another creature and how legitimate it is to advocate, and these, these, um, these creatures have no other advocates than us, how can we advocate and how can we address and, and I find it fascinating to try and feel into what's, um, where the limits are. As you say, where, how much address can a, a nightingale take? How much, how do you speak in the form of a, 
a lynx, you know, without being ludicrous. And, you know, and how where does it become comic? And when it becomes comic, you absolutely have to stop and draw back a bit, you know. But who's t- who's 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 patrolling that border? We are, you know. And as so long as we, we know there's a border and take it seriously and, and feel your way into it, if we don't do it at all, we're stuffed, you know. I mean, yeah, I could say so many things here. And in terms of, you know, uh, in particular, Tim, you have a, a tremendous facility with simile and metaphor to an extent with regard to birds. And that makes sense because you spent a lot of your life looking at birds and um, birds become washing lines with creamy sheets and they become hand rolled cigarettes and a, t- a talking mouth. These are just some of the ones I've written down or they become like casseroles in an oven um, and 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 yet i think that it's about the writer doing it with great care and and attention and attention and attentiveness which is something um i think which is on our radar at the moment because we're forced to be virtual in many ways and we've lost that well it's very we haven't lost it entirely but um it's now hard for us to go out and attend to the world in three dimensions in a, an embodied way at the moment um so my next question is about is about well two, two things really i mean poetry is very central it's to right, can I just interrupt you some second yes yes sure, sure. Was, what kathleen just said was so beautiful and so well said and, and it would lead i know she's got a wonderful poem that she could read if she will <laughs> uh yes. this new and recent lrb poem that, that i think speaks to exactly what you were saying and what you've just started to say as well, but I'm, I'm not trying to take over the, the oh, running of the session. No, no, no. We said, I mean, we're 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 in the same room. We're trying, <laughs> we're trying hard to be in the same room. So absolutely. Shall, shall I read this poem? Thank you, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was lovely. It's well, I say poem, but it's actually a sort of block of, of a block of text because, as I say, I'm, I'm struggling with lyrics, so they're coming out as sort of prosy poem, test watchy things at the minute. But it is about about that, what we can press the natural world into doing for us and when it may resist. Once upon a hill, there grew a tree. Because it had been so long honed by the wind, it appeared like an apostle in a painting to gesture beyond itself towards some greater glory. In this case, the landscape far below. You could lean against the tree and watch the river become a fifth widening over miles as it prepared to meet the sea. You could watch as it bore away not just the winter's rain, goodbye, goodbye, but whatever one needed to lose. And that was plenty, but the trees seemed to insist upon something even further, beyond the braise of the karst and the wind turbines, beyond even the mountains. A gleam of what? Well, this could go either way. We might stay down here and argue that neither ever existed, not the tree, and certainly not the distant constellation. Or perhaps we'd accept the tree, a larch, larch trees being numbered among the objects of this earth. But the intimation? No. Given the tree, though, who can say? It might be there still, for all we know, and isolate on the hill. And if not a tree, then a celandine, awakening into yellow, or a depthless stone, or lark song, or a hare with its world eyes listening. There you are, my lockdown poem. <laughs> That's fantastic, Kathleen. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that it gives us a, a little um, platform diving board, if you will, just to final couple of minutes um, uh, that I've a question I have for you, and then I'm going to go to the questions. We're getting lots of questions and, and warm responses coming in. And that's about your, your practice as writers. How do you achieve this. Um, we know that writing happens in the moment, but it also happens in afterwards. And as we were talking, to an extent, a writer is always writing. Um, I know you both keep notebooks. And in fact, I think we've even got a picture of Tim's notebooks that we can share with everyone. So a world premiere, possibly, of what Tim's notebooks look like. Um, we'll, we'll ask uh, Martin, the technician, to put that up um, shortly. But but how do you how how do you actually work? How do you achieve this? Um, a bit you know this immense, as I say, presentness to the world. Should I start first? Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. Oh, well, there's, I, yes, there's your notebook. We do go back to the notebooks. Um, I mean that, that's that's I mean that's what you learn as a as a young bird watcher is that you need to write things down. You need to describe what you've seen. 
I, I never was very good at the continuous prose as a, a, I didn't keep a diary of my bird watching trips. I just used to keep a list of the birds and note of the weather. John Fanshawe well, well, may well recognize this sort of thing um, and others too. Uh, and But amazingly, I found over the years that just going back to my old notebooks, I've been able to, as I said earlier, I think, reinflate the, the moment, the day from, from that list of species. So it's the boldest of, of lists uh, and uh, just the names of the, the common names for the birds I saw in the order that I saw them. Uh, and that's the place to start. Then the writing is just hell, like everything it is for everybody. Um, 800, 800 drafts and 6,000 revisions. And, and my wife is a scientist, a beautiful, lovely scientist, but a very hardcore scientist, um, crushes everything out of me. Uh, and then I go back and start again and, um, uh, and, and sneak in a few more little metaphors and see the similes and see how they work. Uh, and uh, then she crushes those out again. Uh, and uh, then we get to the, to the page. Um, and I love, to, I love to simplify my writing and I can't do it. I seem to be a, a complicator of, of uh, I, my, my, my conversation is complicating, my speech is complicating. Um, I've got Parkinson's disease, so I have a kind of weird tremble and tremor and will have more, more tremor and trembling in, in my future life. So I see that sort of blurriness at the edge of myself um, very much as my signature. Uh, and that's that's in my writing too. I kind of I don't want anything to stop. You know, there's a, there's a kind of going on a tremble. Uh, my favourite bird is the red star, which has got this beautiful intrinsic glowing red tail that it quivers behind itself. Um, I it was my favourite bird long before I knew I had Parkinson's disease. Um, that's a weird way to answer a question about practice, but that's it really blur. God, I would love to be more complicated. I've got some sort of Calvinist thing about but honing it down, keeping it simple, plain, bloody hell. I would love to, I would love to quiver. <laughs> uh, practice, I don't know. I, I don't actually keep notebooks. I, I, pre I don't practice what I preach. My notebooks are a disaster. I uh, have, have loads. I fill one, one page with all good intention and abandon them. I've got a million abandoned notebooks. I'm very, very fond of the backs of old envelopes, though. <laughs> in any piece of work it begins in the back of an old envelope I keep a supply of these but sitting down if I go somewhere special like going to Alaska I will certainly take notebooks and, and make an effort to, to write things in them but um, memory is a great editor and I'm also a great liar and we all know we've had things airbrushed out of our work and airbrushed in you know so it looks like the truth but yeah, no, all all writing, well, there's a certain amount of artifice. Involved. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, so. I'd, I'd like to, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to propose that because we started around four minutes late, if, if you wouldn't mind, if we can go in about 8.30, uh, sorry, 6.34. Sure. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, just because it'll allow us to take some of the nowhere. questions. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I've got a question, so I'll, I'll break off if you don't mind, both of you, to um, talk to our audience and, and uh, pass the questions on to you. Um, one for you, Kathleen, and it follows up with what we've been talking about. How does poetry allow you to express uh, what prose might not, or vice versa? So it's about poetry and prose, and I'm, I'm also making a big assumption, Tim, I know you, poetry is central to your work. Um, and but but I don't know if you actually write it. But anyway, we'll start with Kathleen and then perhaps hear from you. Um, I, I can't answer any question that begins how because I don't know how. I only know that in the case of the poetry, it can it is a vehicle which enables the things I was speaking about before. Um, apostrophe address, speaking as, you can do those in, in poetry in a way that, you, that one cannot, I cannot, and I don't know anybody who can, you can't do an extended prose without it being ludicrous, you know, so a, poems can get you into the, into the quick of things, into the knots of things, and to speak to things, and to listen to them, you know, much more acutely than, than prose can. Uh, prose allows for a wee bit of narrative, I'm not a fan of narrative. In fact, I had a sign above my desk for ages that just said, nay, narrative. That's how I taught myself to write, you know. 
and um, every time I hear the word story, I flinch because there's more there's more to the human world than story. But um, but that's my beef. So um, I, I don't know how, I just know that it does. Does that help? Lovely, thank you. Yeah, Tim. Well, I, I'm friendly with poets and married to a scientist. Um, so I, I, and I'm neither of those things. Uh, uh, so I, I mean, I, but my, my, my work is, is, is maybe overwrought, maybe, maybe, maybe too thick and too dense sometimes and it's, and lush and, and, and glutted. Um, but that's a kind of love thing, a kind of extension of, of crossing borders and, uh, and, and that blur that I was talking about, I suppose. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I actually I've never found any sort of journalism to be anything remotely as as as, as exciting as my own writing. Um, I and I wish I would could be commissioned as a, as to write pieces as I write rather than as 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 whatever the journal that I'm I am occasionally commissioned to write for seeks to publish. Uh, no one seems to want me as I am um, in short form, so maybe that's that's my lot. Um, uh, yeah, it's a kind of music as well, isn't it? I suppose I mean, it's very composed. My writing, uh, I, I, I'm not a musician, but I love music, and I'm I'm always seeding musical phrases and motifs, you know, back through work and, and on through work and so on. Uh, I'm always I love that that that. The, the I mean, rhyme, I, rhymes in prose and things like that. I would say your writing, uh, both of your writing, it has a very different rhythm. Uh, you know, stylist, stylistics are not stylistics. It's a worldview. It's an internal kind of communication that, that one has as a, as a writer that you're projecting. But, um, but I find both in both of you, you know, pacing in particular, pacing and rhythm. I know that sounds technical, but there is a music definitely in in both um, both writing and I. I, I absolutely agree with Kathleen. I'll just say very quickly, the tyranny of narrative, you know, you know our world seems thick with story, um, but how to get beyond story to another place, maybe that transcendent place I was talking about. Um, I've had a question come in, which I think is, is something that we should definitely pose, which is from Peter Howard, how can creative writing uh, in response uh, or respond to, I think uh, he possibly means, respond to the ecological crisis um, and reach new and larger audiences. So, easy question there. Who would like to take that? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get Robert McFarlane to answer that. I mean, um, that, that's not really my job, or, or maybe Kathleen's either, but um, uh, yeah, it's an awful question, to be honest. I mean, it comes around all the time. Um, you know, everyone does what they can, and, and it's necessary, as Kathleen, say, Kathleen says, to pay attention and to, uh, to advocate. I think close attention to things that uh, you're in that are in front of you and that you love shows uh, you know attention to detail is a species of love uh, and and if you you know we, we might all be singing songs of, of what we're about to lose but uh, you know we need to have a song sung about that as much as 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 the as the facticity of, of, of extinction uh, in order for the things to care about the things that are going to become extinct and, and maybe therefore to do something about it I mean I, I'm, I'm forever failing or, or feeling that I'm failing to make my contribution uh, and all I can do is write about um, the sound of the beak of a spotted flycatcher but actually if I'm being grand for a minute I think the sound of the beak of a spotted flycatcher is worth putting down on paper as much as you know the, the climate the, the the sixth extinction you know and I think actually it's it's easier to write and more telling to write about the sound of the beak of the spotted flycatcher than it is to write about ice melt. Um, I mean, you know this, Gene, as well. And the, 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 the kind of the great derangement is, is proving very difficult to, to get down in words because it's so big. And as, as Rupert was brilliantly talking about in one of your earlier panels, it's it's the scale of the of, of the emergency is, is beyond narrative. It's beyond any individual. It's beyond um, uh, a lifetime of any individual uh, and and to ask a writer to ask a creative writer to stand up and, and save the, the whale or whatever is is a, is a no no hope I think uh, I mean if of course you know writing about whales is is is, in, is as important as as uh, as Greenpeace getting between whalers and and whales 
uh, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't mean that the writer has to be the person who goes on the Greenpeace boat uh, and, and writes about that. I, I, I mean, we need Wales as Philip Hall has, has made Wales, not, not only as, as, and as, and as others have too. I mean, not only as, as, as they would be saved by, you know, a, a creative writer on board a whaling ship or on a whale prevention ship. You've spoken before elsewhere, Tim, about the necessity of bringing creatures into the culture. You know, mm. as, a way, as if the culture were, well, you, you didn't say this, as if the culture were an arc or, cult, or culture, or especially a written culture, mm. it has to save them to some extent just by, just by bringing them aboard to, yeah. you know, I don't know any poems about, what do you call slaters, woodlice? I don't know any poems about woodlice. Does that mean they don't exist in our, our culture, for example, but we need them? So I don't know. Actually, I stopped writing for a couple of years because I just couldn't, I couldn't think my way through this, you know, how to do what was necessary. I was asked to write about extinction. Who the hell can write about extinction? It's the end of imagination. It's the end of joy. It's, it's the end. You, know, you can't write about that. So I didn't do that. And it took me a long while to find my way back into even beginning to think about doing some writing. Um, but I can't, I can't save the world. If I could, and if I could have a huge audience for doing it, I would have done it by now. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, it's a big mantle to carry. And we've had other comments and questions about, again, you know, the limits of language and the limits of the lyric. And um, Terry O'Connor has mentioned that from earliest cave art, humans have appropriated nature as metaphor into language. And yes, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. But in a sense, you know, writers, what are we actually doing? We're interpreting, we're witnessing, we're trying to make sense of, mm -hmm. um, but we are are not ultimately problem solvers, you could say. But this is the million dollar question. I've, I've got a, a, a question, a really interesting question that comes from Mike Toms, who, uh, as you know, Mike is also an ornithologist. He, he asks Tim about the birds in a sense of home, which is, again, something that I think is common to both your books. Birds appear and, 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 and vanish as almost commuting spirits. Um, he asks, how does seeing, do seeing the same species in different places, the swallow in Cambridgeshire as opposed to South Africa, for example, influence your sense of, of home and how you feel about the wider world? Absolutely, that, that has, and that, that, that was one of the, that's one of the guiding, the lightning rod, if you like, for the, for the greenery book, um, discovering that there was a way in which the birds, you know, those swallows, those same familiar swallows from England were, were here around me in Cape Town, and discovering that they were, they were not anything like I was, you know, uh, struggling to, to make, to feel at home here, uh, they were at home here, so that's, that, that's a wonderful thing, I mean, I, I, I also was in, in, on the night of the Brexit referendum, um, was in northern Norway, uh, in a wonderful, um, undark night, in, in an hour, in, 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 which left me with this feeling that um, no decision could have been possibly taken since it hadn't got dark yet. You know, there was no end to that day in, in where I was on a canoe out trying to fish for cod in, in near Tromso. Um, so nature is a great, um, nature is at home in the world and we aren't. And to go back to Kathleen's comment about um, she used to think that uh, that language was what you know was the fallen state of, of, of our species, but you know was what we got as we fell, uh, both theologically but also in our separation from 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 the natural world. I mean, you know, uh, uh, that's that's all important and and germane to this. Um, of course, we don't. We, we can't. We don't do what swallows do. We can't. We do have bags that we take through airports and and, and put in the boots of our cars, um, but. It's a wonderfully. We need to have the, the that I, the idea and the knowledge of them, the scientific knowledge as much as the poetic knowledge of that, uh, in our in our heads to be released into a, into a, a better, being better able to be at home in the world ourselves. I think. Yes, thank you very much, both of you. I'm just going to um, see. Uh, yeah, as a parting shot, um, Candace Piet notes, is nature writing a way of thanking? Is it a way of showing that we are part of it? Uh, a, a, a sense of communal um, awareness of veneration? Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's something that we've we've been talking about ultimately, um, is that this this is your way of being present in the world and reporting 
back what you find, findings, in fact, to think about Kathleen's earlier book title. And um, I think it's now, it's now 6.34 and I'm reluctant to call it a day, but um, everybody has been working hard and um, I would like to release Tim into his two hours later <laughs> evening. He's probably not had dinner um, and the rest of us to have a, a bit of a, a well-earned drink. It's been a very long road, this conference. Well done. Um, yes, Kathleen. No, I was just saying, well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Meals all year. yeah, no, it's been, it's been such a pleasure. And as I say, I'll give you a, a record of the comments that are coming through. People are saying, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So lots of love from the audience. And um, yeah, I think we just have to acknowledge that this year has been extremely tough for all of us and in many different ways. And uh, Joss and John have been stalwart companions through this. And uh, we've, in fact, I think we've, we're very, very good now at organizing and canceling conferences. So if anyone needs anybody to do that, <laughs> we're your team, we're your A team. Um, but a huge thanks to Kathleen and Tim um, fantastic conversation. I mean, I'm multitasking here, so I didn't think I was going to be able to do this, but I've taken lots of notes. It's been absolutely revelatory and it's such a, a pleasure in, in difficult and dark times to share thoughts with, with writers and with our audience. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay, everybody. So that's it from us. Good night. Stay safe. And uh, we'll be seeing you in person in Bath next year at New Nature, New Networks for Nature, sorry, it's a long day, <laughs> New Networks for Nature 2021. Okay. Joss and John, do you want to say any parting shots? I was just very, very glad to see that someone had taken up the mantle of um, digging out some woodlouse poetry into the uh, YouTube chat there, which uh, seems a lovely note to end on. <laughs> Great. Heroic indeed. Yes. John. No, just warm thanks from me as well. And 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 as 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 Jean has just said, we really hope to gather everybody together in um in Bath Spa in um in, in mid-November a year hence. So uh let's hope that uh, for all the reasons we know that we can do that. It would be great to see everybody in person. But this has been fantastic in the interim. So again, Tim, thanks from thanks in Cape Town and Kathleen, thanks in Fife. <laughs>